don't have it muted here. You got to mute. Good morning. I'm uh, glad to see everybody here this morning. Uh, I was duly elected to come do the announcements this morning, mainly because Katrina told me to. So, uh, Brother Ray's not here. He's at home recuperating. He uh, did have to go to the hospital this week, but he's home. I just <clears throat> just texted me back earlier, said he was doing a lot better. The steroids are working. He's still got pneumonia. So he's having to deal with that. So it's going to be a little while before he's back with us. So let's remember him in prayer and all the others. <clears throat> we seem like we've had a uh, kind of a rash of people getting testing positive here the last couple of weeks here at Oak Hill. So let's remember all those that are affected by that. That certainly includes most of us that are affected one way or the other. But good, glad to see y'all here this morning. Good to have you. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna worship God in song, and we're gonna Brother Ed Hurst is gonna come bring the message this morning, and uh, we're gonna we're just gonna worship, and honor God anyway. Got a few announcements. Uh, youth camp will be July fifth through the ninth. See the youth leaders for details and sign up information on that. And uh, we'll be picking up 100 food boxes tomorrow. So please let all, everybody know that you can that may need one so they can come get it or we can get it to them. So uh, that's a lot of boxes to give out. So just remember that. And uh, sign up for the youth meal for, for the Valentine fundraiser. 
uh, February 13th. Just be sure you see one of the youth or somebody and sign up for that. There'll be a meeting right after this morning's service uh, pertaining to the Wild Game Supper. We're just going to meet in the youth room or wherever. We're going to meet back there just for a few minutes, those that are here, and talk about some things there that's coming up. Uh, anything else I might have forgotten that we need to mention? Oh, the tithing reports are in the foyer if anybody needs those. Uh, anything else? <clears throat> as far as prayer requests, you see the list. If you've got a bulletin there, of course, we, uh, they just, they just seem like there's so many here lately, especially those that are dealing with illness with this COVID and stuff. And certainly want to continue to remember Brother Ray and Suge and Emma. I think Emma's finally on the back end of hers quarantine so I'll just remember that. Or anybody else any other prayer requests before we get started? Terry Spivey. Juanita. Juanita. Brother Ed's wife Juanita Hurst. Just remember that. Yeah, Mr. Carter, Bert Carter passed away. <coughs> Anyone else? If not, let's, uh, let's start with the word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us another, <clears throat> another time we can come together and share your word and hear your word proclaimed, Lord, in song and in, 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 uh, and in word. Lord, we just thank you for every opportunity we have that we can join together, Lord. I think we still have the freedom to do that, Lord, in this country. Just be with us now. Be with those that's on our prayer list. Be the ones that uh, it's on our hearts that we don't mention, that we think about daily, those family members and uh, different situations. We just lift them all up to you and ask that you deal with them in a way that only you can. Comfort where the comfort is needed, Lord. Heal, Lord, where it's in your will. And we'll just give you all the honor and the glory and the praise for it all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, good morning. We get everyone to stand with us this morning. Being that we're few in number, we're going to have to sing a little extra loud this morning. Help us out if you don't mind. Somebody, we sang this song about three weeks ago, and I had like a couple of people ask if we do it again, and I don't think either one of them's here, but we're going to do it anyway. How about that? Thank God I'm free. For a long time I traveled down a long, lonely road. My heart was so heavy and said I sang low.
scheduled to start our Sunday school and our Wednesday night classes back this next week. I think we're going to put that off for another couple of weeks till Ray gets back and let's kind of regroup and uh, see what's going on there. So let's kind of get the word out about that. But uh, we have coming this morning, Brother Ed Hurst. He's certainly, if you've been around Brantley County and South Georgia very long, you've, you've heard him or heard of him anyway. He's been in this area a long time preaching and ministering. So Brother Ed, if you'll come bring us God's word.
Thank you so much. It is such a joy for me to be able to be with you today. I grew up just down the road, that first pay road when you come off on, on Slaughterville Road uh, to your left. Not the first house, but the second house down there is where I grew up and uh, on that farm. And my brother Donnie and I uh, worked to help Daddy pay for that farm. And uh, I'm so grateful that we did. And when I was in seminary in 1964-65, he sold all the farm of 30 acres and uh, built that brick house and moved in it, he and mother, and he lived until uh, May of 66. About two weeks before I graduated from seminary, I got a call from my brother Donnie one morning about, well, about noontime saying Daddy had died early, earlier that morning with a massive heart attack. Uh, thank God for the fact he knew the Lord and I knew where he was, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm so thankful to your pastor for asking me to come and uh, preach today. He called me on Wednesday, and I told him I was available and would be ha happy to do so. And then when I uh, hung up the phone, I thought about the fact, Ed, you have got surgery, dental surgery on Friday. Uh, how are you going to be able to preach <laughs> with a sore mouth, or uh, how are you going to handle this? And then my wife also had back surgery scheduled on Thursday in Jessup, and uh, she had that surgery, and uh, I just want to tell you that, I, that the devil didn't want me here this morning. He did everything he could do to keep me from here except kill me, and I'm so glad to be here. Uh, Juanita did well the first couple of days after her surgery, and then yesterday morning I couldn't wake her up. She is diabetic, and I had to call the EMS to come and get her awake and get her, uh, her sugar level back up again. And then yesterday was just a difficult day. She couldn't walk at all. And uh, my daughter's with her t this morning, and she helped me get her up and down. And, and I'm so grateful for that. And then this morning, once again, when, uh, when I got up and I checked her sugar, it was down to 57. If you know anything about diabetes, you know that that's low. She was just before going into a coma once again. But I was able to get some, uh, some uh, glucose in her body, and she, it picked up. And... Uh, she's at home. Just pray for her and pray that this surgery is going to be successful and she'll get free of the pain. I can tell you some other things. Everything, I, everywhere I turned, uh, there was a, some uh, fumble or something going on just to keep me from being able to be here today. Thank God I'm here and I'm so grateful that you're here. I look forward to sharing God's Word with you today. If you'll take your Bible and go ahead and turn to Matthew 28, a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I want to deal with the first part of the of the of that section rather than dealing with the Great Commission as such. I want to deal with the attitudes necessary to fulfill the Great Commission. I had never really thought about that. I knew that oftentimes we didn't do a lot in terms of fulfilling the Great Commission, but uh, several months ago, two or three years ago now, I was studying John MacArthur's commentary and came across this idea of what kind of attitude do I have to have, do you have to have in order for us to carry out the, the Great Commission. And so my message is based on that this morning, and I want to share that with you. And it's three simple points. It'll take me a while to introduce it, but it's three simple points when we get to it. If you are able physically to stand, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word out of respect for it? And I'm reading from the King James in Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. The Bible says, Then the eleven disciples went away, into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came up and spake uh, unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and, on earth, and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Pray with me, please. Father, I thank you so much for Oak Hill Church, for its witness in this community, and for the impact that it's had, the people that have been saved as a result of its witness. I thank you for, the, for Brother Ray and for his ministry over these years, and especially for his ministry here. God, I thank you that you have healed him of COVID, <clears throat> that he's dealing now with pneumonia. I pray that you would bless him, that he might be healed 
very soon of this and be able to regain his strength and be back on a normal schedule, be back in this church serving your people here and preaching the gospel and reaching lost people. Now, Father, as I stand before you and before this congregation today, I know that apart from Jesus Christ, I can do nothing, absolutely nothing. I thank you that Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengtheneth me, and I claim that promise today. And Father, I pray for a special anointing today, a fresh anointing, that I may be able to speak the word of God into the lives of the people of God in the power of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much. You will be seated. Uh, to understand all of the gospel of Matthew and uh, to understand uh, and miss this point in these last few verses is to misunderstand the entire book of Matthew. Uh, the text focus, the, the, the focus of this text uh, is the focus of the gospel of uh, Matthew. It's the focus of the New Testament. It's also the focus of the Old Testament, in fact, all of Scripture. The central message of, of this passage and of Scripture pertains to the central mission of the people of God, the mission that most believers in our day and age either do not understand or uh, they are unwilling to, to be submissive to that mission. Most people think little of their mission uh, except in regard to their own personal needs. We think about our own personal needs. And thus people attend church regularly or spasmodically and are, intent, are involved to the degree that uh, the church ministers to their need and serves their own desires. The average congregation, if they were surveyed today uh, concerning the primary mission of the church, would answer with several, with three, I think, primary uh, answers that they would give. First of all, a large number of people would say the primary mission of the church is, is fellowship, the opportunity to associate with, uh, with other and interact with other fellow believers of similar be beliefs and, and values. They would highly value the fact that, that uh, the church provides activities and programs for all of the members of the family and uh, these relationships are nurtured and uh, shared and the inspiration is, is, is derived from Bible preaching and from good singing like we had this morning and you have in your, in your church. They would, uh, uh, some others would say that uh, uh, sound biblical truth, sound biblical preaching and teaching would be the primary function of the church, the principal function, expounding God's word and strengthening believers in their knowledge of and obedience to the word of God. Like fellowship, this also is a basic need because God gave us a mission, a responsibility. The scripture says in Ephesians 4 verses 11 and 12, and he gave some apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastor and teacher for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. And certainly the sound biblical preaching is important. Uh, still others would say that, that uh, praising God as the, supreme, as the supreme God and supreme being would, be, uh, would in fact be the primary uh, uh, opportunity and responsibility of the church. They would say the church is to be a uh, praising community that exalts uh, Jesus Christ in, in uh, adoration and worship and reverence. Like uh, fellowship and sound biblical preaching, uh, the praising of God is certainly a purpose of God's church and has always been. And that will be what we do in heaven. We'll praise God forever and ever and ever throughout the endless ages of eternity. We are to fellowship with each other. We are to expound the word of God in order to strengthen believers in, in obedience, in understanding and obedience of God's, uh, God's word. Uh, certainly, uh, we are to praise and honor uh, and, and glorify God in every way uh, possible with our life and with our, with our witness. Jesus came into the world uh, to re reveal to us God's glory and God's presence. In John uh, chapter 1, in verse 14, 
the Bible says very clearly to us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, the writer of Hebrews uh, backs this up and underscores this. In verse 3 of chapter 1, the Bible says, who, uh, bring, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when uh, he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the, on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so when we think about these things, all of these emphases, fellowship and sound biblical preaching and, and worship, glorifying God in worship are, are thoroughly biblical and should characterize every single body of Christ. But neither separately nor together do they, do they uh, comprise the, the primary mission of the church, the uh, mission and purpose of the church in the world. The mission that flows out of loving fellowship and spiritual growth and our praising is that of faithful and steadfast uh, being instruments of divine, the divine plan to redeem a lost world. The supreme way that God chose to glorify himself is through the redemption of lost people and it is through our participation in that plan of redemption as he redeems lost people that we most glorify him. You remember Jesus said his supreme mission in this world, he said, I, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In, John, in uh, Luke chapter, uh, chapter 10, and, uh, 19 and verse 10, there's only one reason why God allows you and me when he saves us to stay in this world rather than saving us and taking us right on to heaven. And that reason is the same reason that Jesus was here in this world. According to John uh, chapter 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer and also chapter 21 what Jesus said to them in uh, John 17 in his high priestly prayer, verse 18, uh, Jesus said, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them, the disciples, and then you, hence you and me, into the world. And then in John chapter 20 and uh, verse 20, uh, 21, uh, then, he said, then said he, Jesus, to them uh, again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. As the Father sent me, even so send I you. Now, pastors and preachers and as individual Christians and congregations have become satisfied in our day and age by coming to church regularly or spasmodically to have fellowship with other believers, to hear somebody preach boldly the, the word of God and to, wor and to pr worship and praise him and glorify and celebrate who he is. We have allowed Satan, the greatest deceiver of all, to make us aware, to cause us to believe that coming together for worship is an end of itself. Folks, it is not. It is not. Please don't misunderstand me. The basics that I have mentioned are essential and they are biblical, but they, uh, they are the training, they are the preparation for what God wants us to do day by day, day in and day out as we share the gospel with lost people, as we make disciples of all people. Now, how far would an athlete go toward winning the gold medal if he did all the exercises and all the preparation, did everything necessary in order to win a gold medal, but when the time showed up for the Olympics, he didn't run in the race. He would not win the race. He wouldn't win anything. Uh, and when we think about this, how far would Georgia or Florida or Alabama or some other uh, uh, football team uh, come to winning the national title if all they did was practice and prepare but never went on the field to play the game? 
The same thing applies to us. We prepare and prepare and prepare, but we don't share the good news of the gospel when we are out there seeing people and coming in contact with people. We have, we have missed our mission. What we do on Sundays and Wednesdays in our churches is but preparation for the work we are to do the rest of the week. Let me just share with you a personal testimony that breaks my heart. Alan was one of the best friends, one of the best neighbors that I've ever had. He lived next door to us. When we started to move in, he came over to investigate who was moving in that house. And he became my friend. We talked across the fence. And every time he saw me undertake a chore that was uh, difficult and hard to do, I had two pallets of grass that I needed to lay in. He came straight over there and wheelbarrowed every wheelbarrow of it to the place where we were going to lay it and helped me lay that. We talked about prayer and we talked about Jesus but I never asked him and never pinned him down to know whether or not he knew Jesus. And one uh, week came and I missed him. I didn't see him. He was not out and around. I called his wife, Jenna, and I said, is, is something wrong with Alan? She said, he's in the hospital, the VA hospital in Gainesville with COVID. And then just a few days later, late one afternoon as she was driving home, she called me and told me that Alan had died that day. I don't know whether Alan's with Jesus or not, but I've grieved an awful lot over his death. And I've grieved more over the fact that I didn't nail that down with him and be sure that he knew the Lord and had a right relationship with him and that he's in heaven today. And when I think about this, all of we, 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 what we do at church is training and preparation, but it's not our primary task. The church that is not engaged in the assigned mission is failing in its primary mission and will decline and eventually die. Likewise, the individual believer, not engaged in sharing the good news of the gospel, making disciples as Jesus commanded us to do, will dry up on the vine and become totally ineffective in his Christian life. What would happen today if the, to the human race if couples who were able to produce children had everything they wanted they, and, 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 and they were pleased with their life, made all the uh, money that they wanted to make, but all, each one of them decided not to reproduce. You realize that with the human race, it, we would, there would be no human race in one generation if that happened. The same thing is true with churches that do not reproduce. The Great Commission has to do with evangelizing the lost through our sharing Jesus Christ with them, first and foremost. And then secondly, by enrolling them in church membership through baptism. And thirdly, by discipling them, by teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded us. That's our responsibility and that's our assignment. Now when I think about this, uh, Jesus, as we look at this um, look at this passage of Scripture. This is necessary in order to fulfill the Great Commission. In Jesus' final ap appearance to the disciples, uh, reported by Matthew, he gives three essential attitudes that are necessary in order for us to carry out the Great Commission. Three of them. Number one, the first essential attitude is summarized as availability. And the second one is worship. And the third one as submission. Look closely with me at these three attitudes necessary to carry out the Great Commission. First of all, the attitude of availability. This is, is uh, implied in verse 16 of our text this morning where it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. This is implied by the fact that the, the eleven disciples were where Jesus told them to be at the time he told them to be there. As far as, as we know, uh, as far as we can understand, service uh, to our Lord is the greatest responsibility and availability is the greatest ability any one of us have. Doesn't matter how gifted we are otherwise, availability is the greatest ability that we have. The late Dr. Vance Havner said, he said, don't ask God to use you he said, make yourself available and God will wear you out. He'll use you up. And Dr. Vance looked like death warmed over uh, anyway in most of his life. But he said, and that was so true. 
the most talented and gifted Christian believer among us is useless to the cause of Christ if he or she is not available. Faithful discipleship begins with our simply being available to God to use us however he wants to use us. The 11 disciples had not uh, received the blessing of seeing Jesus, the resurrected Jesus in the garden because uh, like so many people, they were not there. They were unlike the faithful women who were there and saw him after he was first raised from the dead. But now they are where Jesus wanted them to be and consequently they receive his great commission and they also receive the great promise that he will be with them always to the end of their lives or to the end of the age until he comes back again. But now they were where he, Jesus wanted them to be and consequently they received this promise and this commission. Both before and after his, his death and resurrection, Jesus had told them to go to Galilee, that he would meet them there back in, in chapter 26 of Matthew, Matthew's gospel in uh, verse, uh, chapter 26 and verse uh, 30, uh, 32, I believe it is. Verse 32, Jesus said, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. In, in Matthew 28, Jesus said uh, to the women in verse 10, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. That was his commission to, to them. Now in our, in our text, they were gathered where Jesus, the place where Jesus had told them. We do not know how or when he told them when to be there and where to be, exactly what mountain that he should be on in Galilee. Nor are we told how many were present uh, when Jesus gave the Great Commission. I believe that, it, and it seems to me from Scripture, that the 500 brethren that Paul says saw him at one time, in, he writes that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, I believe it was the 500 brethren, the greatest number of believers were not in Judea, not in Jerusalem, but they were in Galilee, and I, there he gave the great commission to them. This is the view of biblical scholars uh, throughout church history, that, that, uh, that this was the group present. In other words, because the great commission applies to, to the entire church. Jesus gathered together the greatest number of disciples that he possibly could gather together his faithful disciples to, to give them the great commission. Note that they were not the most capable uh, people in the world, nor the most intelligent, nor the most powerful, nor the most influential. They came with all of their weaknesses, all of their confusion and their doubts and misgivings and fears to Galilee on that, on that day. But they were where the Lord wanted them and they, their obedience gave evidence of their willingness to be used uh, in his mission. And like Isaiah, after he had seen the Lord in that vision in Isaiah chapter six, and he, he saw him high and lifted up and heard the seraph crying one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Then he heard God saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. I believe these disciples were saying, Lord, we're available. Here we are, send us. Because uh, these disciples were there. Listen, they met Christ, the risen Christ. They were commissioned by him. They received the promise of his continued presence and power in their lives as they ministered uh, and carried out the great commission in his name. It all started with their availability. Is it any wonder that on the day of Pentecost, they baptized 3,000 believers? They were available, and he used them because of their availability. Number two, the attitude of worship in verses 17 and 18, the Bible says, and when they saw him, they worshiped. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. The second attitude is impl implied here for the fulfillment of the Great Commission is that of genuine worship. When, uh, when, we truly wor uh, when we do not truly worship God, 
He cannot, we cannot truly serve him no matter how talented or gifted or well-intentioned we may be. Notice that the moment Jesus appeared, the Bible says they saw him. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. They fell on their faces, I believe, or on their knees, and they worshipped him. They saw him in all of his resurrected glory. And so they prostrated themselves before him in humble adoration before the divine Lord of the universe. When they saw the risen Christ on the hillside, their confusion disappeared. Their shattered dreams were restored. Their sorrow turned unbelievable joy and their disillusionment to unwavering hope. They were, not, uh, they were not worshiping some human ruler, but God's own dear Son, the Lord of heaven and earth. Though no spoken word is recorded, uh, in, in their hearts they must have been saying with Thomas, after his last doubts were laid aside, when he saw Jesus on that second Sunday after he was, after he was raised from the dead, and, he, and Jesus said, Thomas, Reach out and touch the nail prints in my hand and thrust your hand into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas didn't need to do that. He saw him and he said, my Lord and my God. Only one uh, other time are we told in Scripture that they actually worshipped him. After Jesus walked on the water in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 33, The Bible says they worshipped him and said, truly, this is the Son of God. But here they saw the resurrected Christ and worshipped him. It's likely that the worship of these disciples of Jesus Christ on this hill in Galilee has been unequaled or has been equal a few to other times in all of history. Can you imagine being there and seeing Jesus just appear in his glory, the radiance of his glory in that glorified, uh, resurrected body? Uh, his on, uh, as we think about it and look at it, the amazing thing to me is that Matthew said, yet some were doubtful, some doubted. Now his honesty, uh, transparent honesty, he sets forth that, that what, which happened uh, with no attempt to cover it over. His honesty testifies, I think, both to his own integrity and to the integrity of God's Word. The identity of, uh, of who it was that were doubtful and what they doubted is not spelled out in Scripture. We, uh, it could be that they were in the back of the crowd of 500 people and did not see him in his resurrected form as those closer were able to see him. And so they were uncertain as to whether or not it was him. And like Thomas, they, uh, they were more reluctant to, to worship. As, as if to alleviate that, the Bible says Jesus came up and spoke to them. Came up and spoke to them. Do you recognize people by their voice? Don't even see them, but you hear their voice and you know who they are. So many times I've had people say, I knew that was you. I heard your voice and I knew that was you. They knew Jesus' voice. Whatever it was they doubted and whoever it was that doubted, as Jesus drew nearer, they, they lifted their voice in praise and worshiped him. Nothing else now mattered since they were in the presence of the living God. And when you and I come to worship and we find ourselves in the presence of the living God publicly and also privately when we find ourselves in the presence of the living God, nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. Uh, Jesus was there. They, uh, they, uh, they place their complete focus on Jesus Christ, which is the essence of true worship. True worship is single-minded, unhindered, unqualified concentration on Jesus Christ as Lord. Think of it. Think about Paul's determination to know Jesus. Do you have a desire to know him better, to know him more intimately and personally? I do. I've known him for a long time, but I have a longing in my heart to know him more intimately and personally. And let me just share a few uh, scriptures that, uh, to indicate Paul's determination to know him in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2, and this will be familiar to you. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
And then in, in uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul says, wrote to, the, to this church saying, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And then I love Philippians 1.21. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He wanted to know him and wanted to draw closer to him, be there. Unless, I believe unless we worship him during the week, we don't have a real worship experience on Sunday when we come together as the people of God. Unless you, in, uh, you encounter the living Christ, you will never be available. You will never be able to share him with lost people. I remember, and I think my wife got it and pulled it off, down off the line for me. She said uh, a man came to his pastor one day and said, Pastor, I'm not coming back to this church anymore. I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. And he said, why? He said, uh, he said, when I try to worship, he said, I see people that are texting on their phone and people that are talking and this and that and the other. And he said, I can't worship and I'm just not coming back anymore. And the pastor said, well, before you leave, would you do one thing for me? And he said, if I can. He said, I want you to take this, this bucket, this, this glass of water, and I want you to go over to the worship center and I want you to walk up and down the aisles in the worship center and not spill a drop of that water. The man went. He obeyed. He went. And he came back to the pastor's office. And the pastor said, while you were walking those aisles in that worship center, what did you see? And he said, nothing but that glass of water. And the pastors looked at him and said, when you focus on Jesus, like you focused on that glass of water, you'll worship. It won't matter what's going on around you. And folks, that's true. That is true. Now, the third thing that I want to say, the attitude of submission is necessary. In the latter part of, of, of verse 18, Jesus uh, said, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. This is Im implied, their submission. The focus of Jesus' de declaration here is on his sovereign power and authority. But in this context, it also clearly relates to our response, to their response and my response to his authority, to his lordship. Before he states the Great Commission, he, uh, give, he tells them of, of his divine authority to command that. God, uh, the God of heaven, had given him all authority in heaven and in earth. Uh, it, it is because of his sovereign power that his followers are to have an attitude of complete and humble submission to God's will. The word sovereign refers to the freedom and uh, right to speak and act as he pleases. And in relation to God, that sovereignty is absolute and unlimited. And when God says, do this, Folks, he speaks from a standpoint of absolute sovereignty. And we should listen from, an absolute, from a standpoint of absolute submission. The word all here is reinforced and defined by the phrase in heaven and in earth. The sovereign God, a sovereign authority given to Jesus by his heavenly Father is absolute and universal. During his lifetime, he demonstrated his power, his authority over sickness. He healed sick people. He uh, demonstrated his power over disease and over demons, casting demons out of people and over sin as he forgave sin and over death as he raised Lazarus and the widow of Nain's son from the dead. He has the power to bring uh, all mankind before uh, judgment and to condemn those who have rejected Christ himself and to bring life to those who have received him. He said he had the power to lay down his life and take it up again, given to him by the Father in John chapter 10, verse 18. He has the power to rule both heaven and earth and to send Satan to his eternal damnation in the lake of fire. And praise God, one of these days he's going to do that. And I, sometimes I can't wait. 
until he consigns him there along with the, uh, uh, along with the Antichrist and with the, the false prophet. Uh, Jesus is descri- described his, his coming uh, authority back in Matthew chapter 24 and uh, verse uh, 30. He said, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. With power and great glory. His sovereign authority was given to him by his, his father. His father. In John, he has the, the authority to judge. In John chapter 5 and verse 22, the Bible says, and Jesus is speaking. He says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. He has the power, the authority to judge. The Bible says in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Peter speaking, he said, Made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then in, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says that God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Christ, that he is Christ. And that day is coming. Now, before giving them the Great Commission, he established his absolute full-blown authority because he, the command that he gave them would have seemed hopelessly impossible for them to fulfill. Also, they might have ignored it, like a lot of people ignore it in our day. They were, uh, were it not for knowing that the, he, they had the Lord's authority behind them and his, his command, his resources to guide and empower uh, th- these, those 500 nobodies, Powerless individuals would have been totally overwhelmed by the task of making disciples of all nations. We need today to understand that submission to the authority of Jesus is not an option. It's not an option. It is an absolute. It is a supreme obligation. It's not negotiable uh, or adjustable. When God called me to preach, I ran from it for uh, I weren't 16 years old, and I ran from it as far as I could run and he hemmed me up. I was like Jonah. I weren't in the belly of the fish, but I was hemmed up. I couldn't go any further without surrendering to him. It's rather that we should say whatever, sincerely say, whatever, Lord, you command, I will do. I will do. I want to bring my message to a close this morning by looking at Mark chapter 1. If you... I want to turn there in your Bible to Mark chapter 1 and share this experience with you as I close this morning, remembering that the attitude of, of, uh, uh, of availability and worship and submission are necessary in order to carry out the Great Commission. In, in, in Mark chapter 1, beginning verse 40, I'm going to read and then make a brief comment. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. Now listen to this, these next three verses. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him And he was cleansed. And he strictly, Jesus strictly charged him and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing these things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Listen to what he did. But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places that they and they came to him from every every quarter. Now I want you to think about this. Uh, Jesus 
commanded him. He healed him in verse 44 and told him uh, not to tell anyone to go his way and don't tell anyone. Jesus knew that if he did, they'd try to rush to make him king before God was ready for him to die and on a cross. He weren't to be exalted as king of, of the Jews uh, uh, in, in his physical form, but he was to die, and he knew that would happen. But notice in verse 45 what he did. He published it abroad. He blazed it abroad. He told everyone what Jesus had done uh, for him in healing his physical body. Can I tell you this morning that when I and you get as excited about what God has done for us as this man was about what Jesus did in healing him of leprosy, we will tell people about what Jesus has done for us. And when we tell people about what Jesus has done for us, the crowds will gather. If you look in the, in the second chapter of Mark, uh, again, it says Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days. It was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as even about the door. And he preached the word to them. I believe if we get as excited about what uh, Jesus has done for us in transforming our lives and uh, share him like, uh, like this man uh, did uh, that buildings will fill up. People will be saved from everywhere. And people will come to see what's happening, what's going on, what is this great commotion. And I've been praying God will use this pandemic like he used the Spanish flu back in 1918 to bring about another sweeping awakening, great awakening. Folks, we need it in America today. We need it across our world today. And I stand here and confess to you that I'm not as excited all the time as I was when I first got saved, when God first transformed and changed my life. I wanted to tell everybody. I wanted everybody to know. Now, uh, what, uh, what's lacking in my life, and perhaps in your life, and in the church's life, is plain old obedience. Obedience. People say they're saved and do not do what Jesus Christ said, not just here, but in other places. And when you fail to do that, that says you don't know him or you're not submissive to him as Lord. Notice the promise. He said, I myself will be with you to the, all the way to the end of the age, that is, to the end of your life, or until he returns to establish his, his kingdom. Uh, we have the command. And not to obey that command is to sin against Jesus. How long has it been since you shared your testimony with someone? Or since you shared the scriptures with someone concerning salvation? Is there anybody that you're praying for, that you're concerned about, that you are uh, seeking to love lovingly, fi find the opportunity to share Jesus with them? I pray that there is and that God will lay people on your heart, and you'll do just that. Bow with me, please, as we pray. Father, as we come this morning, how grateful I am for the fact you showed me a few years back the importance of these essential, necessary attitudes in order for us to carry out the Great Commission. And Father, I pray today that each one, of, under the sound of my voice, will ask himself or herself, am I really available? Do I really worship? Am I really submissive to the authority of Jesus Christ? I pray that you'd move among us and that if there are decisions that need to be made in this congregation today, that they would respond to you in obedience. In the name of Jesus, amen. In just a moment, we'll sing a hymn of decision. If you're here today and you're not obedient to Christ, or there's, it's lacking in your life, you're not worshiping as you should, you're not obeying him, this altar is wide open and you can come and settle that with him. You can settle it right where you are. It probably would be better if you came here publicly and prayed and settled it and made whatever commitment you need to make. If you're here today and you're lost, let me tell you 
The greatest need you have or will ever have is not money. It's not fame and fortune. It's Jesus. And you can receive him today. And I'll be glad to help you. I'll put my mask back on and I'll be glad to talk to you and lead you in a sinner's prayer and let you come to Christ and know him today. If you're here and you need a church home, church family, and God has brought you here today and wants you here, now would be a good time during this time of invitation to come and say, Preacher, I, w- I know you're not the pastor, but I want to move my life and my letter to this church. Would you do that as God deals with you, do business with him as we stand together and sing? I'll be standing down front if I can help you. Please come. With you. I hope you'll be back at 6 as we worship together again this evening. I'm going to try to preach a message concerning the true identity of Jesus. We really need to know who Jesus is and that'll, that will help our witness to, to a lost world. We don't have Jesus right. We are not saved. And there's a lot of cults out here and a lot of people that don't have Jesus right. Let me turn it back over to Brother Crosby and let you close the service for us as you will. <laughs> 